celebrating Jesus' birthday. If you can grab your Bible and look at uh, the Gospel of Luke, that would be great to be able to follow along with us. In fact, we'll go right to the first chapter, Luke chapter 1. Celebrating Jesus' birthday. <clears throat> There's at least five types of people at Christmas time. Isn't that true? At least, at least five. I'm sure there's more, but, but I just put down a quick five. Uh, number one, the Bah Humbuggers. You can just put Roland's name right next there. <laughs> and then, that's how you spell it, too, just in case you're wondering how to spell Bah Humbuggers. Yeah. The people that just, you know, they look at Christmas and go, eh, you know, why don't we even do this, right? Uh, yeah, and then there's the shoppers, parties, and ambiance. It, it's the, you know, it's really the humanistic side to Christmas. It's the American side to Christmas. Um, and and that's, that's pretty common. It's been going on quite a while here in America. Uh, the third one, here's Santa. There's the people that love to. My wife got a picture of a couple that dressed up at, as Santa's elves or whatever they were in the green tights. And I thought, okay, well, there's, there's a whole different group of uh, thought there that we have to discuss if you're going to dress like that. Uh, fourthly, uh, Jesus who? There's a whole group of people that have no idea uh, who Jesus really even is. And, is he a part of Christmas? That's, uh, that's kind of a, on the outside looking in. And the last one are, are those who are, are worshipers, those who recognize that Christmas is really about Jesus Christ coming uh, for mankind, born uh, to die for our sins. He came as the ultimate gift, and that's really what it comes down to. Uh, why we celebrate his birthday, that, that's really what he wants us to uh, probably question, uh, at least keep it in the forefront of our thoughts. And before we get started, uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for Christmas. I love all the things about Christmas. I do love the music. I do love the food, and I do love the, the lights and the trees. I love the, uh, the nature of a lot of people changes, and they become more friendly, uh, more giving. Um, they seem to enjoy life a little bit better. I do appreciate those things. It's not that I'm ever against that. I grew up... Uh, as a child, uh, doing the same thing as many people who have, have no idea who Jesus is, just going through the Christmas season, doing what Christmas is uh, an American culture, traditional thing, instead of uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. Man, but I do recognize more than anything else, it, it, if we lost all those other trappings of the American culture and tradition, it really comes down to the birth of Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful. 34 years ago, you, you connected with me in a way that I, I never dreamed would be possible, that I'd know God. And 34 years later, I'd still be alive and, and trying to proclaim the, the greatness of God based on that one night driving home. You're so good, and uh, you're so amazing, and I'm so thankful. And I, I want to help others uh, celebrate the birthday of Jesus. And uh, we ask that you, Holy Spirit, would speak in and through uh, even myself, who's flawed and sinful at times, uh, and, and just be able to get the message across why we celebrate Jesus' birthday. And uh, we ask this in his wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Well, why we celebrate his birthday? Number one, with God, nothing will be impossible. That, that's one reason why you celebrate. If you look early on in the book of Luke, you'll see that there is a, a remarkable setting uh, that was already taking place uh, before the discussion of Jesus even, uh, if you look in chapter 1, uh, in, in the forefront of this, it, it's fascinating because we get this uh, scene that a lot of people forget about. It, it's, it's discussing the birth of uh, John the Baptist, who's going to be the forerunner for Christ. In fact, it's, it's Mary's cousin, Elizabeth, that's going to have this child, which should have been celebrated throughout the whole region, but even more so within the family. And then later on, finding out that Mary now is carrying the Messiah. Can you imagine that kind of a family reunion every time that you're rolled by for their birthday? What a remarkable thought. I mean, you got like the forerunner for Jesus Christ, and then you have the Messiah himself at every setting and family gathering. What a crazy thought, isn't it? So when you think about it, and it kind of slows down, demeans your own family settings, doesn't it? You know, well, we don't have a Messiah or a forerunner, but we're going to enjoy our family anyway. But can you imagine that? You had... The two people that would change the course of history for mankind. In chapter 1, in verse 5, it says, There was in the days of Herod the king of Judah, Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. 
They were both righteous before God, walking in the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was while they were serving as priests before God in the order of the division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. Now this is a remarkable gift because this happened uh, as a rarity for a lot of priests because they had the high priest that typically went into, and, and this was the temple of Solomon. It was a remarkable place in which they'd go in and offer sacrifices. And there, there were different rooms as you go through uh, the gate and you come into the courtroom, courtyard area, you go into other rooms. And in each one going into the biggest room back there, there was still a couple extra rooms before you got into the Holy of Holies. Each area that you went into, you had to be in a different relationship with God. It had to be closer, had to be deeper, had to be holy. Because by the time you got behind the Holy of Holies, and, and in a lot of ways they, they used baskets that would hang from the roof so they wouldn't walk on the floor when they were putting these tiles down. That's how holy it was. Just like when I said when the scribes and the Pharisees would write down scripture and copy scripture to pass it on and give it to other synagogues, uh, every time they used the name of Yahweh or Jehovah, uh, they'd have to have a ceremony of a washing and cleansing of their mind, their heart, and their hands. And then they'd go back after they wrote it and do it once again. So when they were doing the Holy, it didn't, they didn't just uh, grab the guy down there in San Jose and say, hey, could you tile our place? They didn't do that. This was a very sanctified and holy place in which only people who were close enough with God could go back there. Do you realize that when they got back behind there, I'm sorry, the picture didn't come through as well. But behind there, there, there was the, this is great because they'd have this offering of incense in front of the altar in which uh, the Ark of the Covenant would sit. And this is the place in which it held the Ten Commandments and, and, and Moses' staff and, and some manna that was brought back during that time of the exit. This is a crazy spot because once you went behind, there was a curtain right behind him that was roughly five to six inches thick and 50 feet high and roughly 50 feet across. This was a huge, it was more like a carpet than it was just a curtain. And when they went back there, they would tie a rope to the priest's waist, and when he'd go back there, a little bell would be on there. And he'd have to shake that every so often to let them know he was still alive. Because if there was any sin found in his life or even in his family, God would strike him dead. That's how holy that place was. This is a crazy thought because Zechariah goes back there. Everybody outside is praying. I mean, this is a very solemn, holy moment in which he's offering up prayers for the nation, for the world, uh, for families, and even for himself. Verse 11 says, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Could you imagine? All of a sudden, it's already enough, can you imagine, enough stress going back there to offer these offerings of sacrifices for sin. And then an angel shows up. That's going to shake things up quite a bit, isn't it? And Zechariah saw him, and he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Now, you almost want to say, no kidding, really? Uh, what a remarkable thought. An angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your, your prayer is heard. Well, that's good. Could you imagine saying, you know what, you're way off base. And all of a sudden, I start backing out of that place as quickly as I possibly could. But he said it opposite. He says, your prayer has been heard. Uh, your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you should call his name John. Well, that sounds great, but she's older. She's probably, a lot of estimates, a lot of scholars believe, it was much like Sarah uh, with, with era, uh, Abraham. He was 100 years old, and she was 90 by the time they gave birth. A lot of them believe this is a, a, a kind of a, a symbolic gesture of God saying, this is once again going to happen in which you're going to get a gift that you didn't expect, nor did you think you deserved. All these years, you didn't have what you thought you were supposed to have, and God is revisiting the very thing you prayed about many years ago. Now, it should tell all of us that when we pray, you shouldn't give up praying. Would you agree that you probably stopped praying about certain things because you thought it was all done? I think a lot of people do. In fact, he says, you're not only going to have a child, it's going to be a boy, and his name's going to be John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. That's a good sign. He's going to be a good kid. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine 
nor strong drink. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. That was unheard of at that time. Holy Spirit only came upon prophets on occasion and will leave. Even kings would get it on occasion and leave. Not until after Jesus Christ was resurrected uh, that the Holy Spirit came upon people who received Christ as Savior permanently. But that's only as an adult. That's only as somebody who makes a conscious choice to give their life to Christ. Right from birth, this child is going to have the Holy Spirit. Many will turn, and then he will turn many of the children of Israel to Lord their God. What a remarkable thought. I mean, what a gift this is, right? I mean, it, this is over-the-top stuff. I, I think about what seems impossible sometimes, uh, and, and I found this. Uh, Peter Glazebrook owns the biggest and heaviest onion in the world. 18 pounds, that's how big that, that to me that's, that seems impossible. And the only reason that onion counts for anything good is because I found a hamburger that can actually use it, you know. This burger is over 2,000 pounds. That to me is impossible. I mean, it's a good impossible, but that sometimes is what we need to look at and say, okay, what is impossible in your life that you believe that God hasn't done yet? Maybe you stop praying about, and you got to realize that God still has something up his sleeve for your life, but he's getting you ready for it. And the problem is our timing is different than God's timing. You ever notice that? And when we get discouraged and give up, it's because this one fact, I prayed about it and didn't come true fast enough. We are a people in a culture of impatience. And when we pray about it, we're expecting it right now. We're, we're expecting it tomorrow. In fact, if I could have had it yesterday. But God is the God who works on the impossible. That's really what it is. He is the God of the impossible. And when this happened, this, this shook up, you know, Zacharias, obviously. And in verse 17, he'll also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. This is how big this child's going to be. First, he gets a visit from an angel in the Holy of Holies, and he's okay. That was a good sign to say, hey, I must be walking right with God. Isn't that good? He, he had this confirmation that, that I have been walking with God. And I wonder, what is the confirmation that you would say today that God says, I'm really pleased with where you're at? You, know, you want answered prayer. You want things to go a certain way. Uh, it's not just, and this is the, the biggest problem, we don't want just temporary blessing. We want the best of the best. Isn't that true? Would you agree you'd rather be blessed long term or something just for the weekend? Yeah, it's, it's something long term. And, and Zacharias got to see that, that his life actually was heading in the right direction and God is answering prayer now. In fact, he's going to give him a child that's going to turn the world upside down. He's going to have the power of Elijah. And th this is a great man of God from the Old Testament. Everybody knew. To turn the hearts of the, of the fathers to the children. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I'm an old man. He started coming up. And this is typical of a lot of us. When God starts to work, He wants to work based on where you're at. Not based on what can't happen. And the problem was, he started going through that list, and maybe you've done this, this battle over your mind. Uh, we've talked about this many times in the past. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he starts talking about strongholds in verse 3. Little spots that are negative that pop up every time the possibility of God working, you come up with a reason why it can't. And we've all done that. We've all come up with, well, I don't know, I, I, this is my track record, or I haven't seen this happen. And then you start playing out and rehearsing the worst case scenario. And he says, you know, we're, we're old. How, how is this going to happen, you know? And my wife, you know, we've never heard of somebody having a child at this latest stage. You know, he's coming up with all the reasons, like Moses did, all the reasons why he can't be used. And the angel answered and said, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and was sent to speak to you and bring you glad tidings. Can you imagine that? Just meeting an angel. I don't know if that, that, that's ever dawned on you how big of a deal that is. Angelos, it, it's a Greek word that literally means messenger of God. And he stands before God. He's Gabriel. He's one of the listed or, or believed to be listed archangels. He's, he's not just a angel. He is an archangel that showed up. So guess what? I stand before the presence of God all the time. This is a promise of God. This isn't just something we're winging here. This is a part of what God's plan is going to look like, and he's going to use you. But behold, you'll be mute. He says, because you didn't believe me. 
You'll be mute, not be able to speak until the day these things take place. So he says, roughly nine months from now, you'll be able to start talking again. And for some of them, we think of people who go, oh, I wish that happened to my... <laughs> That's other people in other churches, amen, right? Okay, good. And, and, and don't worry, it's nobody here. And, and he says, you won't be able to speak until these things take place because you did not believe my words, which were fulfilled in their own time. Now, I wonder how much God doesn't give us based on the fact that we really don't trust or believe him. We, we say we trust him, we say we believe him, but that, that's what everybody else, and maybe you can't kind of buy into it yourself. He says, that's not really what God sees. See, my job as a pastor who loves and cares uh, for you in ways that you don't understand and prays for you on a regular basis is to get you past just this little simple believism to a place where trust happens. This place where you, you understand that God is for you, not against you. Where you start really taking steps of faith. Because if you're still on training wheels with your bicycle, you can't ride the brand new 10 speed. See, he's got to get you to a place where it goes from, okay, I believe in God, and I even own a Bible, and I even read it and pray once in a while, but the, the bottom line, do I really trust him? See, that's what this, this message is about. When you think about, with God, nothing is impossible, well, that sounds good for a lot of people. The problem is, we haven't seen a lot of believers, a lot of Christ followers, say, you know what, I really am, I'm following him to a T, and everything he says I'm starting to believe in Instead of believing in my circumstances or my emotions or the people around me, I, I'm going to start believing in the God that says he's going to do what he's going to do. Philippians 1.6, he says, uh, He who began a good work in you will be faithful until the day of completion in Jesus Christ. Isn't that remarkable? 1 Thessalonians 5.24, he says, you Trust him because he's a God who is faithful. He's a God that consistently shows it. When he says, when you have these pockets, these air bubbles of unbelief, what happens is it, it breaks up your ability to do the right work. I remember my first car was a 62 Pontiac. Uh, I got it on Christmas Day. Uh, I was uh, 17 years old. And uh, I wondered where my bank account had gone, but uh, uh, my dad had purchased a car with my money. It wasn't his money. It was with my money. And, and it's funny because I, I looked outside and I went, wow, I got me, me a car. It's an older car, but, but it was mine, right, which was really cool. And the crazy thing was, I remember as I'm trying to learn how to drive a stick and this big engine and how fast it was and, and you know, it had an a, a electric uh, uh, roof and it was just, it was a crazy, crazy car for a teenager. I remember when I first started learning how to work on the brakes, uh, if I, I didn't know if you allowed air to get in the line when you push the brakes that the brakes wouldn't work until that filled back up through that airline. And a couple of times in Castro Valley, East, part, East Bay part of the Bay Area, there's a lot of hills. And I got to test to find out if my brakes work, right? Which was good and bad because there was times I'd hit it and all of a sudden I wouldn't stop and it'd start to freak me out. Those little air bubbles created a, a lack of an impact with me push. Didn't matter how many times I pushed the brake, it still wasn't stopping. And I got used to that until I learned how, how to figure out the, the brakes and the lines. But the people that drove with me weren't used to that. And I routinely got people to drive with their mouth open on a regular basis. <laughs> and God says, when you have these pockets of unbelief and a lack of trust, and you say, but I've been praying for all these years. I even get to church once in a while. He says, that's not the point. The point isn't whether you get there once in a while. Do you really trust me? What's the actions that provide the factor that you're really trusting me? If there's no actions that go along with your trust, you don't have trust. And Zechariah, even though he prayed, he was a priest, and he went back there, and he had a clean life, he still had a pocket of unbelief in his life. And it cost him nine months without being able to speak because he would not believe God for everything he said. What do you think is delaying your life, the things that God wants to bless you with, based on the fact that there's pockets of unbelief. The people waited for Zacharias and marveled uh, that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision. That they, you know, his face must have looked like he had just gone through. You know, I remember the first time I went on that one roller coaster down in Disneyland that goes by the Mickey Mouse face, the one that goes about 500 miles an hour and up and down and all around. 
That's how I looked when I came off that ride. I thought, oh my goodness, I survived, right? I wonder how his face looked, right? Because apparently uh, he looked different. Maybe he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned to them, but he couldn't, he remained speechless. He couldn't get it out. He kept trying to say the words, but the angel said, no, you're not going to speak until the time comes of this child's birth. So it was as soon as the days of the service were completed that he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days that he looked on me. You take away my reproach, because that was a big deal. If you didn't give birth to a child back in those days, they believed that you were cursed by God. You took away my reproach among people. Hang in there. The sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God uh, to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And this is a great sign because Gabriel's busy. And I like that. And God is using his, his number one guy to go out and get the message out. He came to Mary, and having come in, in verse 28, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Now, that's, that's a crazy thought. That you, you always think that you're doing pretty good, but the, you never expect a visit from an angel, right? And then you don't expect to hear the next words that you're highly favored. That's, that's a crazy thought that God, God sees you and says, the potential that's in you is going to be rewarded. The potential that's in you, God sees great things. The potential that's in you, I can use, so I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to give you a child. How do you register with that? How does that come across in our minds? What, what does it take to get to that spot? Now, there's no track record other than the fact that she's in the lineage of David. He's in this awesome lineage in the book of Matthew and Luke that talks about the lineage all the way up to the Messiah. She's in the line of David. But, but she also apparently was walking with God. Apparently, God said, you know what? I like who you are. I like your character. That's the thing that, that I try to ask God all the time. Not, not whether I'm trying to stay away from the nasty nine or the terrible two sins, but do you like my character? Do you like my integrity? Do, do you like the fact that, that I'm faithful even though there are times I don't want to be faithful? Do you like the fact that I, I, I'm trustworthy, that, that I'm honest, that uh, even if it gets me in trouble by saying the right thing, I'm honest. You won't, you won't think of me as a liar or a cheat. See, this Christmas season, my, my gift to God is, is everything about me. It's not about just doing Christmas. And that's what it was for Mary, too. When she saw him in verse 29, she was troubled at his saying. I mean, I wonder if Gabriel had a little uh, uh, issue at this point. He's emotionally damaged because everybody's afraid of him every time he shows up. She was troubled at his saying. Consider what manner of greeting it was. She's trying. How, how do you wrap your head around that, right? Then the angel said to her, don't be afraid. That sounds easy, doesn't it? Mary, you have found favor with God. That would be a great sign. If God said that to you this week, you found favor with me. I'd love to hear that word. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He'll be great and be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. I mean, this not only is he, she going to have a child, she's not married, so her mind is like everywhere, right? She's never had sex outside of marriage, so her mind is just like <laughs> flying. How is this going to happen? And then my child is going to be on the throne. He's going to be a king. He'll reign over the house of Jacob, not, not just for 10, 20, or 40, forever. How does that work? And of his kingdom, there'll be no end. I would have fainted. I would have, it would have been so much overwhelming information, seeing the angel and getting all this information about the child I'm going to have, and I'm a part of this scenario. What a remarkable time. I, I don't know how she, she had to have been sitting down to hear this. Mary said, hey, how can this be since I don't know a man? The angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. 
Therefore also that the Holy One who is to be born uh, will be called the Son of God. <laughs> I, I don't know if that, that just makes sense to you. Uh, to me, when I, every time I read it, I'm thinking, how would she process that? She's going to have the Son of God? I, this is just, this is such big stuff. And it, it, I, I think he tried to kind of, by using the forerunner and doing what he did earlier with Zacharias and Elizabeth, he probably gave her some place in which she could land with her thoughts to try and wrap her mind around it. Because this is what he says next. He says, now indeed, Elizabeth, in verse 36, your relative has also conceived a son in her old age. Wow, guys, that's some big stuff. You know, that's the thing I like about it. When, when I, I can try and get as many people as I possibly can to walk with God, get close to God, build integrity, build character, uh, build holiness within their life, you know what happens? Good things start to happen. And when one or two people start getting blessed, not only do I know I'm doing my job, but I, I start anticipating bigger things because I know God's up to something. He's moving within people's lives. See, but if people are, are inconsistent and they're here and they're there and they're all over the place, guess what? God can't show up, so therefore... Satan wants to keep you out here. He wants to keep you in a place where it's about stuff and about people and about emotions and about money and about all this stuff instead of about God. And if he can get you off of that consistent relationship with God, of course you don't want to walk with God because nobody else seems to be doing it either. This, this is unbelievable. She's a... This is not a sixth month for her who is called barren. God, God was doing something great. Verse 37, for with God, nothing will be impossible. And Mary said, behold, the maidservant, and she says, I, I'm surrendered to you. Let it be according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now Mary arose in those days, went into the hill country, and haste, uh, the city. When, wouldn't she go around to see uh, Elizabeth yourself? Wouldn't, wouldn't she be in a big hurry? I mean, Elizabeth is 80, 90, or 100 years old. And she's now pregnant with the forerunner of the Messiah. Her cousin Mary hustles up to go see her, and she's pregnant with the Messiah. She entered the house of Zacharias, greeted Elizabeth, and it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. You guys who had had children. You felt children kick, right? Have you ever felt one leap? This was the first Air Jordan move right here. You know? And it leaped within her womb, you know? And he had that same motion with the legs. No, I'm kidding. I don't know. And, and it, was, it was crazy because this is what happened. And it, it leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And things were clicking at a level that nobody had seen before. See, this is one of the keys to nothing with God will be impossible when you get so close to them, all of a sudden the pieces start coming together. That, that's a remarkable thing. The momentum of God starts to move on your behalf. Wouldn't you like to see 2015 where it just seems like everything's working out? Everything goes my way. But it, it comes with the price of do you trust him? See, you can't be wavering. I'm with him. I'm not with him. He's with me. He's not with me. You've know, you got to have that consistent relationship with him. And being filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, she spoke out with a loud voice, saying, Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. She had no pre-knowledge of what's going on other than God speaking. That's the only way you're going to know things are possible with God, is the Holy Spirit is so deep, so committed, and so connected with your life that you start hearing God's voice in a way you've never heard before. And he starts saying, you're blessed, you're in good shape, you're heading in the right direction. But why this is granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? I mean, Mary must have been shaking, her knees must have been quivering, she must have been going, this is some heady things that I've never heard before. For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed. For there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. You know, that's the greatest thing about this. 
Belief is really the responsibility on our part to respond to what's gone. When you get saved, you're just responding to God's calling to your life. That's, that's all it is. It has nothing to do with your prayer. It has nothing to do with how holy you think you are or how, how much potential you have. But it's that connection. Uh, when Jesus was healing, it's fascinating, even using that scripture in, in Mark in chapter 9, the man had that son who was demon-possessed, and he foamed at the mouth, threw himself down, and, and he, he didn't know what, he took his, his son everywhere to get him fixed, get whatever's wrong with him, uh, wiped away from his life, give his son a chance in the future. And, and he looked at Jesus and he goes, yeah, you know, I don't know what else to do. Jesus just told him to believe. I believe, but there, he, he said, help my unbelief. That's a great prayer. Help, help. If I really want 2015, I want this Christmas to be spectacular, help my unbelief. And that's when he told him, everything's possible to those who believe. What, what, what do you want to believe in this Christmas season, in this new year? It's not that God's going to change and get bigger and better. He already is God. He can't get any better. What, is, what has to happen in you? You know, it's fascinating. God is always true to his promises. Whatever he started in you, he'll take it to completion because he perfectly loves you. Nothing is hard if the heart has love. Nothing is impossible when the heart understands. And nothing is heavy when God is in your heart. So when you think about it, why we celebrate his birthday with God, nothing will be impossible. Number two, uh, why we celebrate his birthday, Christmas is first and last an invitation to his party. Go to chapter 2, if you would, please, and look at verse 1. Christmas is first and last an invitation to his party. You know, when you think about this, uh, there's a lot of mixed signals through Christmas season, isn't it? It's easy to get confused about what Christmas is or should be. And if we watch enough commercials, have you watched any TV, watched a ball game or a movie? And how many commercials did you get filled up? Uh, I was watching the game last night, uh, you know, which I think the 49ers showed up, but they didn't play well. Uh, I feel so sad. But when you think about it, how many commercials I've watched this game talked about buying this and buying that? Now, there's nothing wrong with buying stuff. I mean, all of us would sign up for a new bed if we need a new bed or a new fridge or a new car or whatever it is. There's nothing wrong with that. But it was every single commercial. I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, they eliminated a lot of my favorite commercials that talked about food. So I was really disgusted <laughs> that they didn't cover areas that really held my interest. And so really what we have sometimes when you think about this invitation uh, to his birthday, we get a confusing message. We, we, we read things the wrong way. And it, look at this picture, these two people walking past each other, and look at the shadow that cast against the wall. That's not what they were doing. But based on that information we saw, if you didn't see those two people walking across, you'd think that was part of what they were doing. And we do get all these mixed messages. I got two dogs that love to eat and love to snack, and anytime my wife cooks, which is all the time, she's chopping stuff, it could be onions, it could be celery, uh, it, it could be carrots, she doesn't cut, I cut the meat. She hates handling meat. But this is what our kitchen looks like. No matter what it is, we want it, right? And that's the Christmas season for a lot of people. No matter what it is, I want it. I want it. And we have these wish lists. And then we lose the information about what it really comes down to. Christmas isn't about you getting a gift or me getting a gift. It, it's an invitation to Jesus Christ's birth. We say it's an invitation to Jesus Christ's birth and his day and celebrating that. Now, to not exchange gifts, it, it, that's not what it's about. You can. There's nothing wrong with it. He would not say, oh, that's terrible. He loves to make people happy. He loves that we make each other happy. But it's not about that. And, and if we've got off base, guess what? It's because we've chosen another direction to look at Christmas. It was never designed to be what it is today. It never was. Do you realize that the Catholic Church, uh, centuries ago, they were in battle with a couple of other uh, heathen organizations that had uh, become really hot rituals, and, and these were man-made religions, and they were pulling more people away from the Catholic Church. And so what the Catholic Church did 
was they decided that during this time in which they were celebrating and pulling people away from God, they decided to hold a Christ Mass. A Christ Mass on December 25th, representing when he was born. Many scholars believe that he wasn't even born in December. He was probably born in the springtime, when most children were back in those days. It's a different birthing season than it is today, where people are born all throughout the year as a common time. So when you think about it, it slowly changed. Even though they instituted something for us to celebrate it, it slowly got away from this mass, this celebration of Christ, to now where it's become the most materialistic time of the year. We missed the message. You know, when you look at this, it says, It came to pass in the days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth and to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Now what's fascinating is that later throughout the Gospels, Jesus is called the bread of life, right? You heard that before? It's called the bread of life. You know what Bethlehem means in Hebrew? The house of bread. God knew what he was doing. He set everything up, lined everything up perfectly for us to be encouraged to know who he was, to feed off of his life and his teachings. <clears throat> so to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child, verse 6, so why it was, uh, while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in a swaddling cloth, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. It was on the same day country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, this story is common for all of us. We've read this before, but we don't realize the journey they had to take. Can you imagine, uh, you gals, if you're pregnant, they have to get on a donkey and start going over mountains and hills and, and rocky crevices to get to where you've got to go just to be registered. Not, not to go into the hospital, just to get registered. You weren't even going to find a place where people would come and help you. And this is what happened. And she had to go through this long journey. We, we forget the heart. We sing about the baby in the manger. We sing about the angels and the kings. We forget the fact that there is a major, major, can you imagine this journey right now? Sometimes we forget. And that's why I said when, when it comes to uh, five types of people uh, during Christmas time, one is here's sin and the other one is who's Jesus? Or Jesus who? It's funny because uh, I, I saw this uh, and I had to give it to you. December 17, 1903, Orville and Wilbur Wright made their first flight of an airplane at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. On their fifth attempt, the plane under the control of Orville embarked on a 12-second flight. 12, first time mankind's ever gotten off the earth that he chose to go off the earth, okay, let's put it that way, uh, by airplane for 12 seconds. That must have been exhilarating for them. Wilbur rushed to the local telegraph office, sent the following message, we have flown for 12 seconds, we'll be home for Christmas, right? That's the information they gave. Upon receiving the telegram, their sister Catherine went to the newspaper office, told the editor of her brother's new flying machine, right? They, they never heard of something like that. Informed him they would be home for Christmas if he would like to set up an interview. That, that, that's really what she said. Here's what happened in the newspaper. Uh, he told her that that was nice and he would be sure to put something in the paper regarding the boys. On December 19th, the local paper placed the following headline on the sixth page of the paper, Wright Brothers Home for Christmas. <laughs> Completely missed the message of one of the greatest events in human history. And if we look at Christmas, and if you just look at our society, what kind of message do you think that's out there today? Macy's got a two-day sale. Shop at Kohl's. And we miss the message of Christmas. We, we miss the opportunity to realize we, we're here for his birthday. And it got lost. And you know what, what scares me the most? Most people don't care. That's crazy, huh? This is all taking place in verse 9. In the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. These are the lowest positioned people on the totem pole in society for the, the Jews, the Hebrews. 
is somebody that guarded sheep, that were shepherds. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Could you imagine seeing this? It's late at night, right? It's before street lights, right? Before city lights. Uh, it was BS. It was before Spielberg and CGI. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, they get this angel showing up above where their sheep are and where they're at. That's kind of startling, isn't it? Think about that. These guys had no contact with royalty. They had no contact with, with the scriptures on a regular basis. When they got into town, I'm sure they'd make their way to synagogue, plus they'd do business. But the opportunity for them to meet something supernatural was off the charts. An angel of the Lord stood before them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they're greatly afraid. And the angel said to them, it's fascinating, he comes in closer and has contact with He stood before them and, and he says, don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And there will be a sign. These guys are getting insight that the rest of the world would pay big money for. In fact, we're going to give you a sign. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. What? He's not going to be in a palace. What? There's no big celebration. What? It's not in the front page of the Jerusalem Times. Uh, he, he's going to be in some place where, where animals eat and do their thing and sleep. It's going to be smelly, and he's going to be sitting in the middle where they, they typically feed him. Are you kidding me? And suddenly there was, and, and it just got crazier. With them, the angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God. And then they broke out in the song. They broke out in, in what they do at home all the time. What they do inside of heaven, the throne room there. They did what they always do. Glory to God in the highest. And another peace, goodwill toward men. They, they couldn't hold back anymore. You know, they say, Gabriel, go ahead. Say what you got to say. And say, okay, guys, I can't handle it no more. And they all bust out and sing and go, we knew God had, had left the scene for a while. We didn't know where Jesus was. And we were waiting. And all of a sudden, all the signs were coming together. And all of a sudden, uh, Mary's pregnant. All of a sudden, uh, he's showing up out of Mary. And they're going, that's where it is. It's like finding Waldo, right? They're going, oh, my goodness, I finally see it. It was stunning to them. And I'm surprised all the shepherds just didn't keel over and die of a cardiac arrest at that point. I would have. One would have been enough, right? The Bible says in the book of Revelation it's called 10,000 times 10,000 times 10 because that was the highest numerical standard they'd used during that time. So hundreds of thousands of angels show up and it just gets crazy all of a sudden. See, we've lived so long in this world that it's, it's just in these three dimensions that we don't really expect or anticipate the supernatural anymore. We're inundated. Well, man came up with CGI. That's nowhere close to what God does. It's remarkable to know that we have angels all around us, both good and bad. Right now, where you're sitting... You have angels, even a guardian angel possibly around you. And, and, and for some, they're, they're trying to shake you up and wake you up a little bit. For some, they're saying, slow down. Recognize where you're at. For some, they're saying, you need to get holy. For some, they say, do you even know what time of year it is? And they go, we were there. We were there. You know, sometimes we feel like God's not there. That's true. He gave us a promise in Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong, be encouraged. Don't, don't fear, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you, nor will he forsake you. This is God that said, I won't leave you out there. And if you feel alone today, or you feel like you need people over God, that's being alone at its highest level. If you're not comfortable in your own skin by yourself, that is not healthy. You're not as close to God as you think. The 
crazy thought is uh, when the angels had gone away in verse 15 back into heaven, just as soon as they saw him, they took off. I would imagine if they stayed longer, they start asking questions, right? Will the Cubs ever win the World Series, right? Will the Raiders? No, dude. When they'd gone back to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. You know, it's funny. We keep thinking that God doesn't speak anymore. We're so busy with people and phones and computers that, that we have no room. Like I said last week, all, all, the, all the systems are busy. All the lines are busy. And God can't break through because you give him this little slice of a window. God, you got to show up here. And then we're back on our old habits. See, Satan can't steal your salvation, but he can make you so busy you have no idea that God ever existed. They want to go find out what God made known to them. Are you finding out? Would you agree with me? Uh, there's times when we don't know what God's saying and doing. Or are you positioned where you can recognize that God is trying to speak to you again? They came in haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. That, I, that scene, I can't get it out of my head. They, they came up, and, and they, they know where they are. They've seen this, this, this spot, this cave probably, uh, carved out in the hillside. And, and, and they, they walked by it before, and all of a sudden there's a family in there, right? And all of a sudden, there's a baby in the manger that was described just moments beforehand. And they went, wow. And, and they all just took a knee. They said, this is absolutely remarkable that God included even a shepherd in the plan of God. Would you agree at times you don't think you're in God's plans? Do you agree that sometimes you think it's just up to you? You know, God wants you to understand another promise. Over 7,000 in the Bible, over 4,000 that could be applied to believers today. For all the promises of God in Christ are yes and in Christ, amen, to the glory of God through us. He wants you to know today he's on your side. But he's not going to force feed you to walk with him. So why we celebrate his birthday? Uh, number one, with God, nothing is impossible. Number two, Christmas is first and last an invitation to his party. It, it's not your party. It's not Christmas Day thing for you. It's Jesus Christ's birthday. <laughs> the last one is why we celebrate uh, his birthday. The sign of true intimacy is to offer him our best. Uh, take your Bibles, if you would, please, and go back to Matthew. Chapter 2, and we'll wrap this up. Matthew chapter 2. All these familiar stories are great. I love them. I've read them so many times. I've been pastoring for so long. You keep trying to pray and hope that you can take an angle that's not going to be dry and used up or something that won't have an impact on somebody's life. I never want to do or preach a message that doesn't have an impact. So I always pray that he impacts me first so I'm inspired so I can hopefully do the same for you. And, and I felt that this week. I was working on this. I, I mean... We even got up late this morning. I, we, I didn't sleep well. We both got up late and we rushed here and, and tried to get things going. And, and my mind was flooded with so much stuff. I could not contain everything. And, and by the time I was done, I was just kind of buttoning my shirt. And I thought, wow, wh where do I start? And I kept praying, help me condense it to where I can help other people understand what you're trying to say. And he says, you know, the sign of intimacy is what you offer. And it is at your best. You know, when I read this passage here in Matthew, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to uh, Jerusalem. Now, this is a remarkable thing because, as I've said before, uh, this is months and months of journeying to get there. On top of that, they had to prepare and plan. This was something that... that that they had to get all their supplies because they didn't know how many months it was going to take. They, they kind of estimated this was a major trade route, probably from Babylon all the way out to Jerusalem. And, and going that distance, depending on the weather, could be anywhere from six to nine months, just depending on how, if everything went well. 
And then they had to have many camels with all their supplies and food and changes of clothing and all their servants that came with them. They had to pray about and because these were guys that understood scripture. These were guys that came from an area in which Daniel lived. Daniel, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, uh, told them of the forthcoming of and not only the Christ, but also the last days. So these people, there was still a remnant of people that walked with God in battle, and they were still seeking and searching for God. Just like here today in our society, there are still remnants of people that are passionately looking for God and His will. No matter what everything else is going on outside, and this is fascinating, all you got to do is number the people that you hang out with outside of church and count how many actually are passionately in love with your God. It's fascinating. And then they prepared the treasures. They said, what are you going to bring? What are you going to bring? And they weren't trying to weigh out 10%. I guarantee it. They're going to meet the Messiah. They're just weighing out, what do you got that's great? What do you got that's good? What, what, what will mean something, not just that day, but that will help them all the way through this journey? We'll look at that in a second. Now, when I think about this, uh, you know you know this guy right here, right? Don't you? It's kind of fun to do the impossible. Walt Disney, I grew up on that guy. I used to go to Disneyland back in the 60s, you know? And, and it, was, it was remarkable. I mean, I watched him on TV every Sunday night, you know? And, and it was just fascinating uh, to even think about that guy's name. He was magic to me. It was called the Magic Kingdom uh, Disneyland, which he uh, put together. Uh, in fact, on, uh, on Sunday nights, it's called The Wonderful World of Disney. I used to watch that every Sunday night. And as soon as it was over, when I was little with my brothers, as soon as it was over, the FBI came on right after that with Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. I'll never forget. You know why? I hated that guy because that meant I had to go to bed. <laughs> Even in the summertime. I'd be laying there in bed as bright as all get out at 8 o'clock, and I'm going, I'm already in bed. So I start watching TV underneath the door because we had about an inch and a half gap, <laughs> and we had wood floors. But it was upside down, so I was watching it. I was watching the FBI upside down until you know occasionally a parent would walk by and open the door and smack me in the head with the door. <laughs> That's how I remember Walt Disney. Okay, so I tell you, I don't know what that has to do with any message we're talking about. <laughs> but these guys had traveled a long ways to get there. They had done everything they possibly could. They were not going to be unprepared. You ever gone someplace and been unprepared? How, doesn't that give you a quiver in your liver? You show up and you're completely unprepared. You know what? One of my nightmares I used to have for years and years is I'd show up to do a wedding or a service for somebody or a friend, and I, I couldn't find my Bible or my shoes. I don't know why my shoes would be gone, but the Bible would be gone too. And I'd race for that entire nightmare looking for those two things. People would offer me weird shoes and, and different books, and I'd say, no, I can't do it that way. That doesn't work. But to be unprepared is terrible. And to come into this Christmas season and not be spiritually prepared has got to be absolutely crushing to God. So they showed up and they came to the place they thought they'd be able to find uh, information. You figure that maybe he's born in this palace, we're not sure, near Jerusalem. Let's go see the king. Verse 2, where, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we've seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. You know, they, they came... Uh, to a place uh, where they thought they'd find good information to find the hope of mankind. In fact, he's a Jew, so they go to the king of the Jews, but they didn't understand he wasn't a full Jew, but on top of that, they didn't realize this guy was a murderer. He was paranoid, and he was insecure beyond belief. You know how I know this? Every time he felt there was a threat to his kingdom, he'd kill him. He killed all of his sons. He even killed his wife, because he thought they were trying to usurp his authority as king. So now we got kings from another country that are dressed to the hilt and got an entourage that's unbelievable, and they're looking for the king of my country? We've, in fact, it's such a big deal. We've seen his star in the east. It's not just we've heard about something. There's a star that's, that's moving to show us where he's at. This is divine stuff. And we didn't come just to, just to come. We've come to worship him. Herod didn't have any idea what worship looked like. He just thought, oh, you just go to temple. 
It's like a lot of Christians that go to churches all over the country uh, today, uh, Wednesday night for uh, a Christmas Eve service, and they'll go in, they'll fill them up, and they'll light candles and sing, uh, you know, oh, let us come adore him, and things like that, and they'll walk out and not go back there again for another year. They don't know what worship is. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. You know, he says, this was a crazy thing, because now everybody's upset, because guess what? Herod's upset. And if Herod's upset, everybody's going to be upset. If he's willing to kill his kids and his wife based on the fact he thought he was threatened, what do you think he's going to do to the rest of us? So he gathered together all the chief priests. and the He had a meeting uh, with the spiritual leaders of the country. And he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is prophesied, But you, uh, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you, get this, out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. He says, it won't be about man-established kingdoms. It'll be about God's established kingdom. And Herod, when he had secretly called the wise man, determined uh, what time the star had appeared. He, he was trying to get details because he wanted to wipe this kid out. And he sent them to Bethlehem. Go search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me, uh, and he lied, that I may come and worship him also. What a remarkable thought. He turned to the, uh, and it's funny, any time there's a crisis in the country, people go back to the Bible or back to church. After 9-11, they said there was an influx of roughly 40% of the country uh, came back to God for a short period of time. That's a huge number. I remember when, when uh, that happened, I, I was stunned about the amount of people that were bringing friends to church. Crisis had hit. Securities were broken. And I want to find out what God was trying to say. Now, it's fascinating. Habakkuk, you know, if anything, I just like that name, Habakkuk, right? Chapter 2, verses 2 to 3 says, Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets. You know, Because he says, most people will forget. You ever notice that? Anybody that doesn't write down notes... By Tuesday, you're going to forget 85% of what I said. By Wednesday, it's gone. Make it happen on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet to be for an appointed time. But at the end, it will speak. It will not lie. That, that's, when Scripture speaks, it, it doesn't lie. It's true. Truth is always going to be set up in the Word of God. And though it tarries, and here's part of the problem. We always think that, you know, if I didn't have, this thing didn't happen bad uh, to me because I did A, B, and C. God doesn't wind up and smack us every time something we do wrong. Sometimes he waits a little time and then he comes in. And he says, though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. That, that's an old Hebrew word that says, it, it, it will not be long. My mentor used to say all the time, he says, there's always a payday someday. Crazy thought. But they didn't comprehend this. They knew the scriptures. They knew that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. But isn't that fascinating? Even though they knew that he was supposed to be born there, they never looked for him. You don't see anything recorded here that the religious leaders went looking for. Wouldn't that spark your interest? It didn't. And I say the same thing. If you're truly born again, doesn't God's word spark your interest? Doesn't worship spark your interest? That's why it was such a godless society back then, just like it is today. See, I, we've all heard this. I'm spiritual, or I believe in Christ. And they say the words. And Isaiah says it's their, their lips flatter me, but their heart's far from me. I, I find it fascinating because, you know, uh, you're always trying to wrap your head around things. I found this. It says a gigantic uh, fix for the sweet tooth, 7,000 pound lollipop uh, from Seas Candy in California. I mean, that, that's the kind of stuff that gets your mind going, doesn't it? It kind of, kind of makes you, gosh, is that possible? Is that real? Is that something that, that, that actually takes place? And the same thing happens today. Did Christ really come? Uh, did, does God still love us? Is this really about Jesus or about Santa or about me? Uh, 
Watch this story, interesting. When the Walt Disney Company planned a year-long celebration marking the 100th anniversary of Walt Disney's birth, they encountered a unique problem. A survey of visitors at Walt Disney World in Florida found that many of the park's guests under the age of 15 did not know Walt Disney was a real person. They didn't know that. The young people thought Disney was just another company name or a brand name. After the discovery, uh, uh, the company made a special effort to highlight the life and impact of the real Walt Disney. They realized that, that people had lost touch with who actually is Walt Disney. It's kind of the same thing with us. We, we have been generations that, that have no idea. Jesus, who is that? Isn't he an ornament? Isn't he a manger scene that we use every Christmas? Now, it's fascinating that they had... Uh, uh, gotten out of Herod's clutches, and when they heard the king in verse 9, they departed, and behold, the star which had been seen in the east went before, and it continued to move. That must have been just so inspired. Their, their adrenaline, they probably didn't sleep much at this particular point as they got closer, and, and this, this thing started to move before them till it came and stood over, it just stopped. They, they, they actually knew that it was no longer moving. It, it, they had arrived at their destination. Can you imagine their heart rate at that time? And it stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Months and months of planning. And following this star by faith in scriptures, they finally came to where the Christ child was. When they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. When they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, you've got to understand this. This is, this is uh, sometime after he's born. Uh, if you have a manger scene, I hate to tell you, and you have magi there, it's wrong. They came into the manger scene with the shepherds, but they came into a house with the magi. You ever notice that? And they came into this place, and, and they opened their gifts after they worshipped. Isn't that interesting? I've shared that word, proskunasai, is, is the Greek word where they fell down on their faces in the dirt with these fancy, expensive outfits. It's a sign of honor and humility and worship. Sometimes I think uh, people, I did this in the first church I pastored, is when I prayed, we had a large podium and steps that went up it. Uh, I got down in front of everybody on my knees. Not, not to be pious or, or put on the show, but trying to teach them humility to go ahead and get down on their knees before him. It worked for a long time until, you know, it, it, a guy coming out of school didn't have much money, and plus my clothes were pretty old. And, and I remember one pair of slacks I got down on my knees, and as I did, and I got on my knees, they were a little tight, and, and they ripped. They ripped from the bottom all the way to the back up to the top. And I heard it, and the people in the first couple rows heard it. And uh, uh, my lapel mic was on, and this guy, Mike Boggs, who ran the, uh, the sound system in the second, there was a, a deck up above, a second story balcony. And he just, I remember I turned and looked out of the corner, and he stood up and he put his arms up like, what's going on? And I quickly, I flipped over on my backside, stood up and walked and stood behind the podium for the first time. People said, oh, he's not going to pray on his knees anymore. Until the story circulated uh, through the church that something went wrong. Because at that point, I, I, after I got done praying, I didn't let the worship team come up and worship through a couple more songs. I just went right into the message. And it had them pray again at the end. And I snuck down the side aisle and greeted people with my backside up against the wall and shook hands until one little girl, it was Mike Boggs' daughter, uh, Bethany, the little redhead, she came up because she was sitting next to her dad in front of all these people, elders and all kinds of people saying, you ripped your pants, didn't you, like that? <laughs> I said, Bethany, I love you. And she goes, no, you ripped your pants. Daddy thought that was funny. I looked at him and I'll talk to you later. <laughs> but they fell down before him. And they offered him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I don't know if that's the way they did it. But it's a remarkable thought. They brought the gold, which is a sign of honor and respect to a king. But it also... All of these were prophetic. The gold was to pay for their existence as he grew up. You see, that was the first people that said, I'm going to take care of that ministry. 
So they didn't have to worry. They didn't hide for quite a while until Herod died. See, when, when you give to God, you're, you're blessing the ministry. That's what it is. They, they needed that. The frankincense was also a sign of worship because it's what the priest used to burn inside the Holy of Holies. It was an offering, a fragrance that was highly expensive. Nobody could afford uh, any of that but the church, let alone having their own private supply. Remarkable gift. And the last one was myrrh, a gummy substance in which they, they put on people when they died. They wrapped their... Uh, their loved ones in swaddling cloths. It'd be a gumming perfume in which you would hold everything and mummify the person that was in there. It was a sign of prophecy that he came to die for our sins. See, when they came into Christmas, they knew what celebrating his birthday was. It was remarkably different on how we see it today. Being divinely warned in a dream they, they should not return to Herod, they departed their own country to another way. They were close. I can imagine uh, the discussion on the way back to Babylon, what it was like. You know, God tells you today, get ready for your season. The struggles, setbacks, when you're training camp. You've been through enough. The pain has made you stronger. Now it's time to step into your season and shine. He's basically telling you, get ready. And I believe how you handle Christmas is the kickoff to how your 2015 is going to be. You know, I, I, I find it fascinating because a lot of times we forget God's promises are forever. Jesus Christ and his promises are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Keep the Lord's promises in your heart. I will call, and he says, I'll answer. I'll open your heart, I'll enter. Uh, if you'll be my child, I'll be your God. If you'll love me, and be my friend. I'll, I'll come to you. I'll abide you. I'll walk with you. I'll talk with you. I'll direct your path. I'll be with you always. I'll be your savior. I'll be your friend forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my promises to you will not pass away, for my promises are forever. Just as I said, I am forever. I, I, I pray that... Uh, This is a celebration of Jesus' birthday this year. Because I pray for God to bless your new year. I really do. It really is about his birthday. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for a chance to uh, worship you. There's no better place to be any time we open the doors to gather together and <clears throat> worship and praise and thank you and adore you, serve you, give to you fellowship with one another. You gave us several opportunities to do so this year. You gave us a challenge also in Hebrews chapter 10 that we should make it a practice of gathering together and not falling short of that. I thank you, Father, for uh, this last year. I thank you for uh, everything you've done. I thank you for what you're doing right now as you work in people's hearts and minds preparing them uh, for their next step. For a lot of us, we think of Christmas and New Year's as the end of the year, but I think of it as preparation for the next. And I'm praying that you'll uh, work on the hearts and minds of all those who hear this message. If they start looking ahead, not, not just uh, hoping and wishing 2015 will be greater than 2014, but they start living in preparation for that. I pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, this week we honor and glorify you in a way that maybe we've never done before. That people will truly know that this is not about Santa, not about gifts. It's about Jesus Christ. And I pray, Heavenly Father, you'll send us out as brilliant lights in a world that's desperately searching for hope. And we pray this in the matchless, holy, and almighty name of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 <clears throat>